Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to another incredible show of Israel Unplugged. This is where you get the unadulterated facts of where we're holding in the redemptive process, focusing primarily on the ingathering of the exiles. This is Josh Wander from Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh, and I'm here with my co-host, Rabbi Moshe Lichtman. Yes, from Beit Shemesh, Ira Kodesh. All places in Israel are kadosh, are holy. We're going to save that discussion for another time. I think there's only one year ago. This, but that's, that's the time. No, a, a lower level of holiness, but it's still holy. So we, we are so we happy. Can, don't we say in, in Kaddish, uh, Kaddisha Hadain, when we're in Israel? It is, a ho- it is a holy place. Go on. Yes, but you're right. Jerusalem is the holiest. We have we have an incredible show uh, up next, so you don't want to miss this. This show is going to have a very special guest. It's a former member of the 19th Knesset, Rabbi Dov Lipman, who was also from Beit Shemesh. And he is an Ole Chadash, a new immigrant who came from Silver Spring, Maryland. We're going to talk about his background. We're going to talk about a little bit of politics and what he's doing today. And we're going to discuss all about Aliyah related topics uh, and Eretz Israel. So, those people that this interests them, they have come to the right place. Uh, there is a lot of excitement going on in the world today. There's excitement with Corona. There's excitement going on, positive and negative, with uh, with the financial instability, uh, with uh, riots that are going on, the election that's coming up soon in the United States, which no one knows exactly what the results of that are going to be. And uh, this is we. What we all do know is that we're living in incredible times, times which can really uh, not not can are changing. The world is changing before our eyes, and we're living in we living. We're privileged to live in such a special place in such a special time, and uh, we're happy to have you with us. And you want to stay tuned uh, to our show because this is going to be an exciting one. And thank you so much for tuning in to Israel Unplugged. We'll be up with you next. Always challenging the status quo. Hello, I'm Rod Bryant on Beyond the Matrix here at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I want to encourage you to listen each week, every Wednesday at the same time, for an amazing show that will challenge you, inform you, and inspire. News, views, and wisdom for the nations. Here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Don't forget, Beyond the Matrix every week, Wednesday, here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Welcome back to Israel Unplugged. This is Josh Wander with Rabbi Moshe Lichtman, and I'm here with our special guest, Rabbi Dove Lipman, who is today a senior manager uh, and community outreach for HonestReporting.com. Rabbi Dove Lipman was elected to the 19th Knesset in January 2013, making him the first American-born member of Knesset in nearly 30 years. He rose to national and international prominence for his role in combating religious extremism in Beit Shemesh. The author of seven books about Judaism and Israel, Rabbi Lippmann holds rabbinic ordination from Nair Israel Rabbinical College and a master's in education from Johns Hopkins University. He moved to Israel from Silver Spring, Maryland in July 2004 four with his wife Dina and his four children, one of which is going to be married, getting married this Thursday, Mazel Tov. And since 2015, a former MK Lipman has been a columnist for the Jerusalem Post and Times of Israel, a political co- commentator for ILTV and I-24 News, and has focused on Israel advocacy both in Israel and abroad. Welcome, Rabbi Lipman. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. 
So first of all, this is an Aliyah show. So there's so much to talk about. I'm sure that all of our listeners are interested both in the intrigue of uh, politics here in Israel as well as your your Israel advocacy with honest reporting. And we'd like to talk about both of these things, but we want to set, focus and center on uh, Aliyah. And we know that you have a, a book that is called Coming Home, Living in the Land of Israel in Jewish Tradition and Thought. If you can get it on Amazon. And let's start off with that. Tell us about that book. So I spent a year traveling around mostly North America on behalf of Nefesh Benefesh to try to inspire people to make Aliyah, or at the very least to reawaken a discussion about Aliyah. People uh, fall into a sense of complacency, and they support Israel, but Israel's over there. And I spent the year talking about my Aliyah story, and uh, I, learned, uh, I, I, I learned that I have a talent that uh, with just a few stories, I was able to bring people to, to tears uh, just about my own Aliyah story. And I believe everybody's Aliyah story can be that way. And, you know, I'd go to Kiddush after Shabbat morning, and husbands and wives would really come over and actually talk about uh, perhaps exploring Aliyah. And that led to the idea, uh, via Nefesh, to put out uh, a book which talks about the, the centrality of living in the land of Israel, uh, in Jewish tradition and Jewish thought. I, I went through 12 years of Jewish day school experience in North America, wonderful schools, and I'm not here to say anything negative about the schools that I went to, but no one ever stood in front of a classroom that I was in and talked about the mitzvah of living in Israel. We, we marched for Israel, we celebrated Yom Ma'ut, but whereas we focused a lot on Tzitzit and Tfilin and Lashon Hara and, and other, the other mitzvot, uh, it was never taught in that context that to be a full-fledged Jew, the land of Israel, living in the land of Israel, has to be part of that. And therefore, that's what I tried to capture uh, in this book, going back to the basic sources. And I know that you know, Rabbi that has, has many, many different uh, works uh, which address this issue. I tried to do it in a very succinct way, in a way which I thought would speak to younger people, that they could read this and say, oh my goodness, I didn't know about all of this, and at least awaken the possibility of exploring the idea of living in Israel. By the way, this is a live show, so people that have any questions for us or for Rabbi Lipman, they can call in from North America at uh, 301-768-4841 or in Israel at 02 uh, You raised an, a very, very important point, which is, and again, it's not about a specific school. I think it's, it's a problem across, systemic problem across the board in the United States, in North America, that the the educational system does not promote uh, sufficiently the centrality of Eretz Israel, and that's why you find other places in the world where there's incredible Ali ah rates, and in North America there's just a trickle. Uh, what can be done about it? That's that's the real the, the biggest question. The elephant in the room is what can we do to change that situation? I do believe that it definitely ultimately comes down to education, and I, I believe that it's critical that the, the same way we teach about any other subject in Judaism, uh, I shouldn't even say the same way, a greater priority based on the sources should be put to Eretz Yisrael, and it is an issue of working together with principles and with Rabbanim, and it's hard. It's hard for a Rebbe to stand up in front of a classroom and talk about how you must live in Israel while they're living in America. There are Rabbanim who, who have a difficult time doing so, but the more uh, we get educational materials and the more we work with them, that, that's where it really has to happen. But I will also say there's another avenue, and that also could be through outside of school youth groups, for sure. I, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and uh, the B'nai Akiva there from, I'm talking about now in the 1970s and early 80s, is a, a very high percentage of, of people who are part of that who ended up coming to Israel because it was B'nai Akiva really focused on Yishuv Eretz Yisrael and the importance of that. And I believe that's another avenue uh, which can be used uh, where it's not necessarily through the schools or for the shuls where people certainly have a struggle in terms of teaching about it, but it can be done outside of school by those who really do have a passion through Shlichim uh, who go to these places and really try to inspire young people. I, it, it's amazing to me uh, I've been involved in all kinds of programs for gap years and, and even for non-religious uh, Jews who come to Israel. And when you give them a real, authentic Israel experience and really submerge them in what's happening in Israel, something awakens inside of them, and they want to be part of it. And they either stay here or they want to come back. And, and that's a critical piece as well in terms of the experiential uh, connection to Israel. Those are all the things that have to be done. And I would want to see the state of Israel uh, absolutely make that a priority. 
Yeah, I, I would I would add that um, you touched on it, but the the main place where this message has to be given over is in the gap year schools, and that's what I've been trying to do for so many years uh, to speak to these uh, to speak to these students, uh, get an opportunity to get to get into the yeshiva or the seminary, to talk to them and to sell my books, and you know it. It helps a little bit. There certainly are are people who make Aliyah, but on the other hand, it's very sad to say that there are, and I know every one of the yeshivot and seminaries, there are those that do not talk about it. I was in a very famous, very famous one. You wouldn't, you'd be shocked if I would tell you which yeshiva it was, and I gave a whole speech. To, it's usually at the end of the year around Yom Atzma'ud time, and one of the students came up to me afterwards and said, this is the first time anybody said anything to us about the importance of living in Israel. This was at the end of the year in a in a Hezder yeshiva. It has to be done. This is the way. This is the place where it has to be emphasized, and it's unfortunately not being emphasized in the yeshivot. Just and, and like by in the, the way, United States. One of the, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why there is a fear to talk about it, is because uh, do you want your yeshiva to be known as a place which inspires the students to stay in Israel, and then what ramifications does that have on the parents of reluctance of sending the students to Israel? There are some yeshivot and seminaries which have been outright, we are here for this purpose, and parents who are uh, committed to their children living in Israel are at peace with their children going there. But other places, there's a fear about that. One of the things that I used to say uh, in the shuls uh, when I would speak on Shabbat morning, and I would talk about uh, the, the landing of living in Israel, and I would say, if you don't have the opportunity to live there, certainly encourage your children to. And I said, the real test is when your child goes to Israel after high school, and they call you and they say, Abba, Ima, Mom, Dad, I love Israel so much, I want to make Israel my home. Do you pop uh, champagne and say, Baruch Hashem, we succeeded in a real Jewish education for our children? Or are you, are you devastated by the news and try to stop them from doing so? That's the real test for commitment to Eretz Israel. And I'm not suggesting at all that it's easy to have children make that decision and move away from family. But when it's all said and done, it comes down to uh, those kinds of decisions where you can really see uh, where the passions are and, and, and what where the commitment is. And, and that's what we have to I agree with Rabbi Lichman 100% that during the year, while they're here, uh, it's certainly a tremendous opportunity to inspire them towards Aliyah again. And, and the main focus when I speak is, this is not some new found uh, uh, plan or project or, uh, or idea, but to, to emphasize the centrality that it plays uh, within Jewish tradition, both halacha and hashkafa, both in law and in philosophy, and that's the point that has to be given over. Because most children, when they hear that, uh, assuming that they're committed, they want to pursue it, and they want to explore it. So we actually have a conflict of interests on both sides. We In the United States, you have a conflict of interests of the Jewish leadership and rabbis to discuss Aliyah because they're afraid of their congregants, or, or either not liking what they have to say or the fact that they might be seen as hypocrites. And you have the conflict of interests here in Israel of schools being afraid to talk about Aliyah because parents abroad may not want to send their children to those institutions. I would say even further that when you, when, you, when you inspire the ones that do speak about it, when you inspire them, you often have a Yom Kippur effect, meaning they're very inspired at the moment, just like we all are on Yom Kippur. And then as soon as the, you hear the chauffeur blow and they go back uh, for the summer, uh, all of a sudden things cool, cool down and they may not have that same uh, excitement that they had during their gap year. I know both of you have been involved uh, with uh, with gap year students, what can be done both to encourage institutions to speak more about Aliyah and what can be done to inspire them and keep them inspired uh, after they go back home? Home in, in parentheses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, once, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm sure everyone listening will, will agree with me. Once uh, a student goes back to the United States or, or to whatever country they came from uh, before they came to Israel, uh, even if they're all fired up and inspired by Israel, it's very, very difficult uh, to maintain uh, their commitment to coming back to Israel. Uh, it's very hard. You're talking about years of college, meeting potential spouses, and at this very low percentage that actually comes back. That's why it's so important uh, for them to consider the option uh, of staying. I don't have any specific words of wisdom uh, in terms of how we can get the shivot or the seminaries uh, to do so. I, I really don't. Uh, I will tell you that... Uh, Rabbi Lippin, Rabbi Lippin, we're coming on a hard break. Is it possible to continue this in the next segment? Absolutely. 
Okay, so we're going to continue on this next segment. For people that are just tuning in now, we're here with former member of Knesset, Rabbi Dov Lipman, and he's discussing the concept of Aliyah. Please stay tuned right after this break. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. Okay, welcome back to Israel Unplugged. We were just in the middle of speaking with former member of Knesset, Rabbi Dov Libman, and he was in the middle of a thought about how we can keep our children that are sent here to Israel for the gap year here to stay in Eretz Israel. I don't know exactly what can be done in terms of the institutions themselves, because I don't know that they will uh, speak more about Aliyah, but I definitely know that from the state of Israel's side, uh, there are definitely things that I hope can be done to make Aliyah easier for young people, both in terms of infrastructure, both in terms of the process, uh, in terms of when they're required to do Army, when not, and give them a variety of options to be able to stay here. Uh, that is definitely something which could help, and that's something which has been uh, explored, uh, but there needs to be, from my perspective, a much greater commitment uh, from the state in order to do that. Right, and there should also be more uh, input from the state of Israel, maybe maybe extra funding for those schools that will have special programs that do talk about Aliyah. I mean, I personally, I know I have a four-part series that, I, that I've given at various different institutions, and, you know, if it could be that... You know, a, uh, an institution would get an extra stipend, would get an extra, ex, some extra money be, if they if they let me in. So that would also help. Things like that, I think, would would help. And and also, as I said during the break, uh, there has to be a, a good option of a college for for American students here in Israel, especially something like a uh, yeshiva university. Um, you know, we wish that there would be uh, that 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 would be able to happen. Yes. So we, jumped, we jumped ahead to the uh, to Rabbi Lippman being uh, a representative of Israel Advocacy with uh, honest reporting and him being a member of Knesset, uh, a former member of Knesset. How did you get here in the first place, Rabbi Whitman? It's really interesting. So many people tell me from the moment my wife and I got married, we were always heading towards Israel. This was always the goal. It actually wasn't our situation. Uh, we were very much rooted in the United States. We were not on a path towards Aliyah. I was very focused on chinuch and education in America. In November 2003, the school where I was teaching, the Berman Hebrew Academy, brought the students on a school mission to Israel. And my wife and I went along as chaperones. And I, to this day, don't know if they succeeded in inspiring the students to be connected to Israel, but they did a masterful job connecting the staff to Israel. During those 11 days, uh, something pulled at us on a very deep level, and we looked at each other and we said, what are we doing uh, raising our kids in America when we have the opportunity to raise them in Israel? And once I was able to secure jobs teaching in Israel, beginning of 2004, we decided we're going to make Aliyah the following summer. And then I had to make the phone call, which uh, anybody who makes Aliyah dreads making, and that is the phone call to my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother, uh, who has since passed away, but at that time, uh, she was in the golden years of her life, a Holocaust survivor, enjoying uh, her grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Thank God she lived to see great-great-grandchildren. And she was in New York. We were in Maryland. We saw her all the time. And now I have to tell her that we're moving to Israel. I was so afraid to make this call. But I finally found the courage. I picked up the phone, and I said, Bubby, I have some news for you. God willing, this summer, Dean and myself and the children are moving to Israel, making Aliyah. And I was prepared for what I somewhat jokingly call the wrath of Bubby. Uh, my grandmother did not have much political correctness. She said whatever was on her mind, and I was prepared for her to express her pain over the fact that we were moving away. There was a pause after I shared the news, and then my grandmother said, 
ברוך אתה השם אלוקינו מלך העולם שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. full blessing with shame ומלכות and took my breath away and I, I said to her where did that come from? And she said when she was on the boat going to America after the Holocaust the entire way she was asking herself why am I on a boat going in this direction to another foreign country to the Jewish people when I could be on a boat going in the other direction where a new Jewish state is being born in our biblical and our ancestral homeland. And she said, even though our experience in America has been comfortable and we've grown as a family and we've been welcomed as a people, she said for her to know that her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren are settling in Israel, she has nothing, nothing uh, but thanks to God. A- and that bracha keeps me going all the time. Because Aliyah is not easy, and, and nothing in life that's worthwhile is easy. But whenever a challenge comes, I just sort of zoom back and think about Uh, what my grandmother's bracha and how much it meant to her, even though she wouldn't be seeing us, uh, it was her greatest joy that we were going to be living in Israel. It's something I think about all the time. And the next part of the story, which I think about all the time, is fast forward to July 2004. We drove up the New Jersey Turnpike. We went to JFK Airport. We had this emotional goodbye ceremony with Nefesh Benefesh. We were on one of the first Nefesh Benefesh flights. And we're getting our children settled on the plane. And the pilot Uh, it was an Israeli accent, presumably a former Israeli Air Force pilot, goes through the regular routine that you hear pilots say before any flight. And then at the end, he says, everybody sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. I'm here to take you home. And, and he said that, and I froze in place for a moment, because the magnitude of what was happening all of a sudden hit me, just in those words. At 2,000 years ago, our ancestors were ruthlessly exiled from the land of Israel, And for 2,000 years, wherever they were, in the worst persecution, they said, Shana HaBav Yerushalayim, and they believed that the prophecies would come true about a return to that land. And here I was, my wife and I, blessed to be the links of the chain to bring us back home. And, and all of a sudden, I, I realized this wasn't just, oh, a nice little move uh, to another place, which might be better for our family. It's not just a move to fulfill a mitzvah and the Torah, but it's literally, uh, we are the fulfillment of the words of the prophets. Uh, as we're coming back here, and those are things which I think about uh, all the time, uh, because when you're living here, it can't just be the day-to-day, here's the shopping list, here's the this. You have to always, always remember uh, the, the magnitude of what is happening here, and then we are part of this most incredible, incredible step uh, in Jewish history. Wow, you're, 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 inspi- you're inspiring me. And, and, you know, I've been living here 30 years and I've written, as you said, so many books on it. I mean, I'm, I'm crying here. Like, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I can't understand how any Jew can hear things like this and not pick up and, and, and come on Aliyah. I just don't get it. But, you know, I guess uh, we're going to have to wait for Mashiach to come to really... Uh... It is actually, listen, you're reading something. My wife and I always ask ourselves, we're in Sefer Devarim now, where it seems like Almost every parent, Moshe Rabbeinu, is talking about the land which Hashem gave to you, the land which God gave to you, over and over again. And I actually ask myself, what did I used to think when I sat in shul week after week, year after year, and heard those words? It's almost like there's a block that's there. And I'm not saying this to speak down to anyone, because people are, I was that person. Uh, there's like a blockage that's there. You don't realize that Moshe Rabbeinu is talking to us, and he's saying, God has given us this gift, and it's for you to come and take as, a, as an inheritance. And, you know, one of the things that I write about in my book, and I know that I've ever this book, it's filled with this as well, is you, you go through the history of people who, who made such sacrifices uh, to be able to come here and to be here in the most difficult of circumstances. And then you fast forward to 2020 and, and, the, and the conveniences uh, that are in place. Uh, it, it's really, uh, God is saying, here, it's here for you to take. Make yourself a life here. And, and it's the greatest joy. I tell people always, people always ask, do you have any regrets? I, not, not only no regrets, I, it's the greatest joy with all the challenges. And I'm not suggesting that it was simple. We certainly had challenges in terms of raising children here and certainly challenges in terms of Parnassah here and, and a lot many other issues that come along the way of being far away from family. But there's not a moment of, of, of regret, because you can't even describe in words what it is to raise your family here in a Jewish state, where, where, where they're in the land that Hashem has given to us, where, where, where literally I'm living in Beit Shemesh, and I can look out. Beit Shemesh is described in the Navi itself. Things happen here. This is where we were. 
Uh, I couldn't do that in Silver Spring, Maryland. And 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 everything you know, according to the post game, everything that you do here, if you're a construction worker, when you go to work here, you're fulfilling a mitzvah in the Torah of building the land of Israel. Everything that we're doing, we're part of that process. And and I often think to myself, like a few hundred years from now, when I look back historically. These are the years, we're only 72 years into this, these are the years where this country was being rebuilt, and we get to be part of that. That's not just living your life, you're, you're, you're part of changing the course of, of history, and that's what I try to convey to people, because it gives a whole new meaning to life. Everyone is looking for meaning. Everyone wants to do something meaningful. Uh, and it's difficult. You know, people have their you know, midlife crisis because they feel they haven't accomplished something. Picking up and coming to Israel, whether you're a young person straight out of high school or college, or you're doing it with your family, that is in itself, in and of itself, the most meaningful <laughs> act uh, that you can do. And it takes over your entire life and says your life has now been one of great meaning. And you don't have to look for anything else at that point. Absolutely. It, you know that uh, we talked about, uh, you mentioned your grandmother uh, as a Holocaust survivor, and there are many people that are very concerned. We only have a very short time left on this segment. Maybe you want to stay for another, it's up to you. But uh, I really want to hear from you what you think about the instability that's going on in the United States right now and, and, and the caution to the, United, to the American Jewry uh, that a Holocaust, I'm not saying that it's going to happen in America, but it definitely feels very scary to be a Jew in America today. You deal with honest reporting. You deal with the misinformation and the anti-Semitism in the media. I'm sure you feel this every day. Let, let me say it this way. I go to college campuses, and you see Jewish children who grew up in strongly Jewish homes, strongly Zionistic homes, who go to the campus, and, and Israel has presented them as Israel's on one side of the equation, and human rights and justice is the other side of the equation. And they're young college students, and en masse, they're choosing, uh, uh, they're choosing the social justice and, and the, uh, the opposite side uh, of Israel. That's one thing that's going on. And then there's obviously the undercurrent of anti-Semitism. We deal with it in honor supporting uh, all the time, where no matter how, and I'm not here to speak badly about the United States of America as a whole, uh, but, but I, I'm looking at it from afar, and I'm concerned for, for people in my family uh, who live in, in America and, and what's going to happen uh, over time. And I, I'm not someone who wants to see Aliyah because people are afraid of what they're experiencing. I think it's important that Aliyah has to be from a place of, this is where I belong. And, and that's the way uh, I try to focus Rabbi on Rabbi Lichtman, we have quick. another break. Uh, Could you stick on for one, more, for one more segment? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Stay tuned. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany is but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel, Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound, the most essential, and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power. How did a nice Jewish girl from Delaware end up living in Israel? Shalom! I'm Natalie Sapinski. Join me on my show, Returning Home. Meet different people who have moved to Israel. Hear their personal stories, their highs, their lows, and everything in between. Each week, we talk to experts on immigration and the process of moving to Israel. Listen to Returning Home every Thursday, only on Israel News Talk Radio.
Welcome back to Israel Unplugged. I'm here talking with former member of Knesset, Rabbi Dov Lipman, and we were just discussing anti-Semitism, the rise of anti-Semitism uh, globally and in the United States, and uh, and we got stopped by Fox News, so we're back. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was uh, saying that, you know, in honest reporting, one of the things that we do is we try to certainly uh, expose anti-Semitism and call it out. People aren't comfortable uh, with that. One of the things we show is that a lot of the anti-Israel sentiment that's out there in the media and other places is actually anti-Semitism that's masked uh, as anti-Israel. But uh, I, I really come to a conclusion that it's very difficult to actually combat anti-Semitism, to, to change people's uh, minds. We try to show that that anti-Semitism is racism as well. So if you're anti-racism, you have to be anti against anti-Semitism. But I always, when I speak about it, I, I heard this beautiful mashal from Rosh Hashanah Feivel Mendelovich, and he said that American Jewry, this is his words, American Jewry, he said, is like the polar bear in the Bronx Zoo. What does that mean? Go to the Bronx Zoo, and you just watch the polar bear there. He has the snow and the ice and all of the things that he would have in his natural habitat, and then you zoom and his diet and everything else, but you zoom out, he's in the middle of the Bronx. That's not where he's supposed to be. So he said, we have all the comforts, and we, we feel uh, that, that this is our place. We have schools, and we have shuls, and we have restaurants, and we have everything that a Jew could want and feel so comfortable. But he said, if you zoom out, this is, this is not your place. And if anything, the anti-Semitism is, is reminding people of that. So I wouldn't want people to move to Israel to flee from anti-Semitism, but I would hope that the rise of anti-Semitism at least makes them realize that this is not our, our natural place. And our natural place to be is in the land of Israel, where, yes, we may have enemies uh, from the outside that we have to battle and defend ourselves, but it's the homeland of the Jewish people. And that's the recognition uh, that I really hope that people will come to. Yeah, I heard a different uh, mashal, a former Rebbe of mine who unfortunately just passed away. I mean, he was in his 90s, uh, Rabbi Sinai Adler, uh, also a Holocaust survivor. And he once was in America, and uh, a student of his asked him, no, so what did you think of America? He said, America is galus wrapped in chocolate. It's still galus. It might feel good, it might taste good. Good, but it's it doesn't change the fact that it's galut, and and the problem is that now that chocolate is becoming less and less sweet. It's becoming more and more bitter, bitter chocolate, and uh, the problem is that the Jews in America are so used to it that they they're not even recognizing that things are changing and it's time to go. And I so I agree with you. There's no question that the reason a Jew should come is because. This is where he belongs. Eretz Yisrael is where he belongs. But, you know, when push comes to shove, there's got to be a point at which he realizes that, you know, he's got to flee and he's got to come back to the to the Jewish homeland. Um, uh, Rabbi Lipman, I wanted to just mention uh, another thing also related to our topic. You know, uh, Rabbi Lipman and I are not only... Uh, uh, do not only live in the same city, Beit Shemesh, a few uh, blocks from each other, go to the same shul often, um, but we are, have a much, you know, a, a much longer uh, relationship. First of all, his first job in, in in Israel that he said he talked about before was his teaching in a yeshiva that I also taught in, um, but we go back even further back. His, his wife, his wife lived right next to, literally across the street from my parents' home. My parents are very good friends, were very good friends with his in-laws. And the reason I'm telling you this is because there's a, there's a Beit Knesset, a shul in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where they're from, called Beit, Beit Yitzchak Chevra Tehillim. A very beautiful shul, actually has a stained glass window, really, really very, very beautiful place. And my father, Alava Shalom, was the chazan there, and his, Rabbi Lipman's father-in-law is now in charge of the place. And it's really a sign of what Galus is all about, because it was such a happening place when I was growing up. It was, you know, the, the it was the special shul in the community. Everyone loved it. And there was a, t- ten, hundreds of people that would come to shul. It would be filled to the, to the brim. But then nowadays they can barely get a minion because Galut is, is you know things change people move to different places and and it's the saddest thing to see how the shul is dying out 
but it's what Gullus is all about. That's not where we belong. It's not where you know the Jewish people belong. The only place where we can really build and and set permanent roots is in here in Eretz Yisrael. And it's also, uh, you're making a very good point. It's so depressing when I go back to that shul and I see what it is now. It's also, this is our destination. There's no Jew who wouldn't agree that Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, is, not, is going to be our, is our destination. That's where we're heading, and this is the place where our future is. So, so why not be part of that? Why not give your children uh, the opportunity to be part of that? One of, one of the greatest moments my wife and I had was when our children, we were talking about our Aliyah, and they were talking about how they can't believe that we picked up the four young children uh, and came here. And one of our children said to us, I want to thank you uh, for making Aliyah, because I, I don't know that I would have had the courage or the ability to leave America and come here, but, but, but because you brought us here, now we're here. And this is where our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Hashem will be. And I say to people, why not give your children and your future generations that gift of just being in the place where the final destination is going to be and be part of what's happening there and be part of a jury that's only going to grow and thrive and continue in that way as opposed to exactly what Rabbi Lichman just described, where every community at some point uh, goes through this story and eventually moves to another place and, and you have the minion dwindling out. And why be part of that? instead of be part of the growth that's happening here in Israel. Absolutely. Uh, I think that, uh, that we want to talk a little bit about, more about uh, you're not just any a new immigrant to Israel. You're a new immigrant to Israel that became a uh, member of Israeli's parliament, the, the Knesset, and uh, there is so much excitement going on. Uh, we, we watch anxiously all of your posts when it comes to uh, the, the newest things in Israeli politics. And, of course, a lot of that relates to um, Aliyah and relates to Corona and relates to what's going on uh, globally around the world and Jews coming back home. What can you share with us as far as your experience and perhaps even current events uh, in politics here in Israel, relating to Ali and relating to the Jews around the world? Absolutely. Serving in the Knesset was, was the greatest bracha, first of all, uh, to be able to be part of that process. Even the parliament uh, in Israel is part of building Eretz Israel, And I got to meet people from so many different backgrounds. And I'm going to put aside uh, the Arab parties for a moment. Everyone else that was there, even if I disagreed with them completely, they were making decisions that they felt were best for the Jewish people. That's an unbelievable thing. That when you go and vote, right, you know that you're voting for people, whatever, wherever you are in the political spectrum, it's about what you believe is best for the Jewish people. And that's why you see such passion. Uh, and it, every issue is that way, uh, because people take it uh, so seriously. And I have to tell you, one of the things that I saw in the Knesset, people, I was nervous that I wouldn't be welcomed there because I didn't serve in the army, I came to Israel much later. They were so inspired by the fact that we made Aliyah. They're like, you came here from America? So many of us dream of maybe spending a few years or living in America, and you came here? And the greatest moment of inspiration for that came with current President Ruben Rivlin. We served in the Knesset uh, together. He was a regular member of Knesset during the 19th Knesset. And I was sitting next to him in a committee, and I said to him, I'm so jealous of you that you... Uh, you're like a ninth generation in Yushalayim. His, his, his great-great-grandparents were, were students of the Vilna Gaon and came here. And he said to me, you're jealous of me? I'm jealous of you. You got to do what Avraham Avinu did. You chose Israel. Uh, where I'm so inspired by that. And, and it was an amazing thing to see how they were able to welcome me, little me, into the Knesset and say that I was a source of inspiration because I made Aliyah. So the politics... Is, is absolutely crazy. Uh, it's the, it, it showed me the nace of Hashem running this land, because things behind the scenes, whatever you see in front, is it, even worse uh, behind the scenes. And it's chaotic, and it's, and, and, it's, and it's just out of order. And somehow, at the end of the day, the country is functioning. And even with all the challenges, with Corona, with everything else, uh, we, at the end of the day, we're here, and, and Mufat Hashem will continue thriving. And for me, we were shlichim, where, where people are put in place here, and I was given the opportunity to, to do some good things for Israel, but, but it really showed me the, the miracle of Israel, both in terms of the fact that we actually have our own parliament, 
where people are really trying to think about what's best for the Jewish people, each one coming from their own background, but also the actual chaos that you see uh, on TV and in the news, uh, for me, is another proof of the fact that this is a land of, of God where, where miracles happen and he just keeps things running, uh, even though we're going through challenging times. But I also saw behind the scenes tremendous unity. Behind the scenes, camaraderie, unity, with all the politics, a lot of that is for show, sadly, uh, and there really was an opportunity in one building every day for people from all different backgrounds to come together and work together, and that was part of Kibbutz Galiot as well, seeing people from aliyahs all around the world with their own perspectives, trying to work together and make decisions. For me, it was a daily inspiration and a daily reminder of the incredible times in which we live. So we only have about one minute left of the show. Would you like to say your final words? I just want to say that to people, to people who are listening, ask yourselves, what would your great, great, great grandparents have given up to breathe the air of Israel for five minutes? Uh, they would have given up so much for that experience. And now we're blessed for some reason to be in a generation where Hashem has given it to us. It's here. And therefore, I encourage everyone to seriously consider Aliyah, to explore it. And if you determine that you can't make Aliyah, raise your children to make Aliyah and celebrate that they have a passion for Israel, want to come here. And then you can join them afterwards uh, when you're retired. Retirement here that can be great. But, but one thing is for sure, Hashem has given us this gift. It can't be business as usual, and I hope that everyone will take advantage of the opportunity and seriously make living in Israel and Aliyah a serious part of their life. Thank you, Rabbi Rabbi Lippman. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. We hope to have you again. Thank you so much. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips. With scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel. Plus, little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 